You're watching EVH and Gear TV, brought to you by Stuart Travel Guitars. See the incredible stowaway travel guitar at stewartguitars.com. Microphones for EVH and Gear TV are provided by Rode Microphones. And official Van Halen merchandise is provided by vanhalenstore.com. Here's your host from Ontario, Canada, EVH artist Eric Broadbent. Hey everyone, it is the weekend. Happy Friday to you all. You're watching EVH and Gear TV. We are live and making a long overdue, and I mean a very long overdue return autographs. Steve Lynch. Steve, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on again. It's been a pleasure. Been looking forward to this one for quite some time. Yeah, absolutely. Me too. Fantastic. Before we get into the program here tonight, folks, we've got a bunch of people jumping over in the chat. We're going to have some fun, a little bit of a different approach here to the show. Partway through the program, uh, Steve has generously uh, offered to show us a couple really cool licks. So if any of you guys and girls out there have your guitars handy, and as I tried to mention, uh, probably not all of you got to see it on Facebook, but Steve tunes down a full step. That's correct? Yes, that's correct. So full, full step, step full step down, and he's going to teach us a couple of his kind of really cool licks. So we have a little bit of a bonus for EVH and Gear TV fans here tonight. But that's coming up shortly into the program. And if any of you are new here tonight, if it's your first time to the channel, if you would uh, be so uh, kind to subscribe, I promise to work just as hard to keep you as a subscriber as we did to get you here. And Steve, since the last time, it's been, I don't even know how long it's been, about eight, nine months, I think, since last time yeah. you're on here. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, maybe a year, right? Yeah. Maybe somewhere in there. But you've had an incredibly, incredibly busy tour. Started in January, and I was looking at the tour date. Say it goes right into May of next year. So, kind of tell us what you've been doing all, uh, since last your last visit here. Uh, touring a lot. Uh, we released the uh, the new album. Um, you know, get off your ass. And uh, we've been uh, writing some more stuff, and uh, we've released a couple of videos. Get off your ass, and every generation that people can view on on uh, YouTube, and and we've been keeping the. The store going and everything like that at autographband.com. So if people want merch, always people are always asking me about merch. So you know, go to just autograph.com and it's right there. Fantastic. We we have a couple links as well too that we'll be sharing throughout the evening. We've got your uh, your Twitter, Instagram, and of course the website as well too. So those will be posted and they'll be shared in the chat as well too. Actually, they're in the description right now, so people can uh -huh. follow that. But that's good. So um, yeah, I didn't I didn't realize the merch was available there. So that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Very very good. Oh. If they can't make the concert, at least they can still get some of the uh, the swag as well. Right. Fantastic. I'm going to say hi to a bunch of people jumping in the chat that want to say hi to you, and we'll jump back to them quite a few times throughout the evening. Sure. Um, they're jumping in nice and early before the show even started. Sean Close is here. Uh, he says, uh, hey, uh, uh, heck yeah, Steve Lynch, my friend and I saw Autograph and Striper last Saturday here in Vegas at the Canary uh, Casino and got a picture with him. Great guy and great player. So that's cool. Got some fans in the oh, house. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Those, they'd be a fun band to play with, eh, uh, Michael and, and the guys? Striper. Striper would be fun to play with. Oh yeah, Striper was great. Yeah, they were great guys, and they're they're a great band, and so we had a lot of fun with them. We played a few shows with them. Yeah, it was was Oz back with them then? Uh, but not back in the eighties. More recently. No, no, I no, 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 that. But like, no, was Oz Fox playing with them last last week? There, he was talking about. Yes. Uh huh. Okay, he's yeah. back. Good. Good to see him back on the stage. Um, Alan Hollers joining in from Detroit. Tesla Troops is here. Says can't wait. Ricky Mees. Um, get him to talk about some of the two-hand tap and slide like he did on Turn Up the Radio. Yeah, we'll be talking about that a lot to, tonight, some of the okay. two-hand tapping. Um, and Alan Holler is asking to, to talk about how your gear has evolved over the years. We'll get into that as well tonight as well. Um, Phoenix van der Vaden, um, all the way from over in Brazil, she's saying, uh, can't wait, Steve is my biggest influence. She's a, a master shredder herself, so uh, apparently you're one Very of her cool. biggest influences. Yeah, very cool. Nice yeah. to hear. Yeah, f f uh, my good friend Carlos Santon from Canada here. Happy Friday, everyone. Thank you, Steve. I love your playing and willingness to teach and share. All right, very cool. Car Carlos is a, is a school teacher, so you know different different background, but still teaching. I know you've got a, a illustrious career in, in teaching. So whether you're teaching guitar or teaching sports, whatever, it's still teaching, right? Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I teach here down in uh, the Tampa Bay area. And so still doing it, still still got some students, and uh, I like the one-on-one -on -one thing, and uh, I enjoy doing clinics as well. I did a lot of clinics. I did like 325 clinics in 20 different countries, so. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty tiring, but. <laughs> yeah, I, I bet. Do, do you find a lot of times, too, teaching, like, I'm sure there's sometimes, you know, teaching can become, it's a job, too, and it can be stressful at times, but do you find you learn sometimes from your students as well? Yeah, I do. I'm. What I do is I teach a lot of songwriting 
too. And so that kind of brings out a lot in me because, well, I'll have a student bring in just a beginning piece, you know, to a song and then we'll, I'll say, okay, here's the different directions you can go with it and everything. Here's the next part and everything. And so, um, I really enjoy that a lot because it brings out my creativity as far as writing goes. And then I'd like to see my students come along as far as um, how to construct solos because I don't really improvise solos. In fact, I never have. I've always recorded solos. Like for Turn Up the Radio, that was seven, eight-hour days that I put into that solo. Wow. I actually went into the studio and did it because I'm very picky about, you know, how the song sounds, you know, in the, in the um, or how the solo sounds in the song and make sure it fits right. You know, when I come in, I make sure it blends with the vocals. And uh, when I come out, I want to make sure that it sounds right with the vocals and everything. So there's a lot of uh, uh, construction that, that is, you know, composition that actually gets put into it. And But I like doing it that way because I like to find the perfect solo for each song. I like that. So in other words, instead of like a lot of players out there, you know, there's no real right or wrong, but a lot of players will, whatever feels good in the moment and they capture it, then they've almost got to go back and learn what they did when they go play it live. It's like, what did right. they do there, right? So yeah. for you, it's the opposite way. You you orchestrate it and it's constructed, so it's probably much easier for you to repeat again and again accurately. Right. After 22 years off from autograph, though, I had to go and do my homework because I didn't remember some of the parts. Am I doing this with my right hand and my left hand, or am I just doing it with my left hand? You know, I mean, uh, it, was, it was hard to tell some of the parts, you know, but I... I decide, deciphered it, and it eventually all came together. Did you Did you watch any YouTube videos of people um, copying autograph to go learn it? <laughs> yeah, I, people still still send them to me, you know. And uh, God, some of them just nail it. You know, they just nail it perfectly on turn up the radio and stuff, and some of my own, other solos. So it's That's- really cool to see. Looking at some of your videos online today and uh, searching for some of your solo videos on, on show day, I always like to get in the mindset of the guests. So I was watching a lot of your guitar solos, and we'll talk about some of them later tonight too. But I, I did see that same thing. I saw a list of people doing all covers of tributes to you. And what's so cool, no matter who the guitar player is, whether it's you or Eddie Van Halen or Ingve Malmsteen or whoever your hero is, you know, the, there's always somebody that does something really, really cool by the guitar. So like there might be one guy or girl that's copying one of your tapping parts. But nobody ever does them exactly like you, the artist, but you see all these different interpretations, and it's neat to see how people interpret your music and your, your style. It's very, very cool. Yeah, exactly. They kind of, like my students, you know, when I, when I show them things, and plus people that learn out of my books and stuff, they, they kind of take their, their own view of it and, and go their own way and kind of innovate something into their own, you know, playing style. And I think that's really cool. That's what I want them to do. So not to copy me exactly. I just give them the tools to work with. Yeah. Well, I really like the point that where you said that you focus heavily on songwriting at a at an entry early entry point too, because a lot of people you see these young kids on social media, and when I say kids, anybody that's under thirty to me is considered a kid these days. Right. But you know, um, showing these great chops and stuff like that, but they lack in songwriting. They can't write a song to save their life, and it's nothing to you know nothing bad about them. I'm not saying anything negative. It's the fact they haven't had the experience. They haven't jammed with bands. They haven't written you know rough right. songs. So I think getting those skills long before you can shred is uh, is a because there's great songs out there that have no shred. I'm really a stipulator on teaching people how to write songs, how to construct songs, because I mean you're really not going to get anywhere. I mean there's you know how many shredders there are out there that mm-hmm. just play their ass off, you know. But um, the thing is, is you got to be able to fit that into you know a rhythmic structure first of all. So you got to play with people and you got to play with a metronome even before that. But uh, what's important is your creativity. Take a little bit from each different player that, that you really like. Like take some of your favorite things from like Steve Vai or Joe Satre or, or like you said, Ingve Malmsteen or Eddie Van Halen or whoever the guitarist may be. You know, just take a little bit from that, your favorite parts of them, and then, you know, go, go from there on it. The last person I really listened to was Alan Holsworth. Yeah. In 1978 off the UK album and off the Jean-Luc Pony's uh, album, uh, Enigmatic Ocean. And I just loved his playing, but then I stopped listening to guitar players at that point because of the fact that I, I so everything I heard, I started absorbing because everything I, I hear, I remember. Right. And so then I find it coming out in my playing, you know, and I found out a lot with, with Jeff Beck, you know, when I was playing and I just stopped listening altogether in 1978. Um, after listening to Alan Holsworth and being influenced by him, I just thought, you know what? I got to just go on my own path. And I thought Alan Holsworth was doing a lot of stuff two-handed, but he just had this big, long stretch with his left hand that he was doing. And, and uh, it just sounded so legato and just, just so melodic. And the, 
the phrases that he was playing, it was just just incredible. I'm really glad you mentioned him as well, too, because obviously a huge influence on Eddie Van Halen. And, you know, we're, we're not going to go down the Eddie Van Halen rabbit hole too far tonight. But, I mean, uh, one of people, I always ask guests on the show, what's your favorite uh, Van Halen tone period or album? And for me, it's fair warning. And one of the, the biggest reasons is that Eddie was really heavily influenced by Alan at that time. And you're just right. hearing these crazy skit scat, you know, all, you know, scatterbrain riffs. And, uh, like, you, the fluidness between solos and stuff like that. It was like it was a real turning point in his... You know, I think it was uh, maturity in his playing. Not that he necessarily well, needed maturity, but he, he, um, it was just really got came to life, and that's Alan Holdsworth for sure. But I do agree with you. Listening to this stuff, you have to turn it off, or eventually, without even thinking about it, you're going to come up with something, and it's going, oh my god, that sounds like so and so. And how how did that happen? Well, well, I was listening to it yesterday. That's what I was realizing, and that's why I just stopped listening to players. And I think a lot of players, just like, you know, George Lynch and and myself and Eddie, we're all we're all 63 years old. Mm-hmm. You see, so we're all of the same age. And so we get, we grew up on that same bowl of Cheerios, the same guys. Like probably early on, like Eric Clapton and Jeff Beck and, you know, Jimmy Page and, of course, Jimi Hendrix. You know, he was one of my first early uh, influences. So, yeah, you know, we all grew up with the same players, you know, basically. But we went our own way with it. And then we listened to later players like Alan Holsworth and Al Jimmy Ola and John McLaughlin and stuff like that, which kind of took me on a whole different adventure. That's right. And here's something that I agree with you, and I believe this story 100% about you saying how you turn stuff off. Because a lot of people that aren't, you know, you know, kind of in the know of your your history and your career, a lot of people think, okay, well, Autograph's just another 80s band that's tapping at Eddie Van Halen. But no, it's not. And if, if I have some of my facts correct, you know, I'm trying to prepare for the show. Um, number one, you were doing a lot of this stuff before you'd even really heard what Eddie was doing. Was it uh, uh, Chapman from the Chapman Stick? And yep. uh, Harvey Harvey Mandel, which I had, I went down a couple rabbit holes of YouTube today, and holy cow, I'll talk about that in a minute. Some stuff, great discoveries. Just yep. learning more about you, but uh, those guys were doing a certain thing that you know up until the point uh, of your career, like you you wanted something else. You wanted to you know hear different sounds coming out of the instrument, and it just wasn't done in a traditional way. So is that somewhat correct? Yeah, that is correct. Exactly. It was Harvey Mandel was the first one I actually saw playing it, but there's a guy from 1964. That you can Google, um, he's playing it on classical guitar, 1964 two handed, you know, Italian guitar player. Yeah, I wrote and his he, name down. He's playing on classical, and he's actually a doctor. He's playing all this wild stuff, you know. But then um, the first one I saw playing it live was Harvey Mandel. And I, I had already been doing a little bit because this guy in Seattle named Steve Buffington had, had been doing it as well. I'm watching him play, and, and he was about the same age as me as well. And so I asked him what he was doing, he showed me a couple of things, and then. Right, right after that, I saw Harvey Mandel play, and he was doing, you know, two and three finger stuff, and I just went, "Wow, oh, that's really cool." So I started experimenting with it. But then, what really got me was when I was first going to the Guitar Institute of Technology, and I saw, you know, uh, Emma Chapman, the mm-hmm. inventor of the Chapman stick. And uh, what happened with that was he was up there playing this incredible instrument, you know, five five strings that they play on the on the bass strings for comping and everything, and then you. Then you play with your right hand and you're playing melodies and solos and everything. And and so I just thought it was really cool that he was separating strings like that, five strings for the bass and five strings for the for the higher melodies and everything. Um, and he said that he got started on guitar and he just took it so far that he had to make come up with an instrument to accompany himself better. And that's why he invented this instrument. But I asked him after the clinic, I said, so what were you talking about when you said that you got so far with guitar, you know, and um, so I handed him my guitar. He said, let me see your guitar and I'll show you. And so he just, I just handed him the guitar and he showed me like a pentatonic scale and I, and then he showed what you can do over the top of it and everything and just the lights went off, you know, and <laughs> it was, it was a good thing because it was right at the beginning of the school. And so I was just learning all the different positions of the pentatonic, all the major scales, all the arpeggios, all the intervals and, and uh, triads and everything. And so I took it all and I started writing it down so that you could play each different thing two handed, all the pentatonic positions, all the triads and all that kind of stuff. And, and it just, I just kept on writing and writing and writing. By the end of the year, I had a stack about that thick of pages that I'd written on how all of the curriculum that was coming from the school, you could do it actually two handed. So you were probably one of, if not the pioneer of that style. Is that correct? Well, at least one of them for sure. Uh, probably one of them because uh, what I did was I I wrote the book on it, you know, and I think that that's the first thing. And I yeah. really thought, like, how does this really 
really play into using both hands on the fingerboard to actually play these scales and and combine different effects and everything like sliding and bending and vibrato and all that kind of stuff and uh, pull offs everything to make it sound more interesting because uh, you know I, I was in a school all of jazz players and that's all it was and all the teachers there were jazz teachers there was a couple fusion teachers like my teacher from Seattle Don Mock mm -hmm. uh, but most of it was old school jazz guys and so I was kind of picking their brain but what I really wanted to do was I wanted to you know incorporate all those ideas into more of a rock mode that's why I have a little bit more of a wall sense I think that a lot of uh, other guitar players because I'm thinking more jazz than I am um, you know rock stuff sure. typical, uh, you know like uh, pentatonic riffs and stuff like that which are great but I just wanted to take it a step further and so as, as far as being a pioneer in the technique I guess I was because I hadn't heard anybody doing the interval skips and stuff like that and using triads and and all that and into the, incorporating into their songs which I do a lot see what I do when I'm writing is I try to play against each chord that's going by. Okay. You know, not just playing over the top of it in the same key, but I listen to each chord that's going by. And I'll break that down a little bit in the solo when I explain, you know, what I'm doing and turn up the radio and stuff. So, you know, people can see exactly what I'm talking about. I like that. One of the riffs I saw you do, and you might even demonstrate that later on tonight too. This was really, really cool. It's almost like, you know, you, you, I picture it like a drunk guy coming out of the bar at night and he, he takes three steps forward he, and he falls back two, takes three more. So you're doing these riffs where you're, it's a two hand tapping, but you'll do, uh, you'll go up three, down one, up three again. And, and the, it creates this really, really cool, um, energy and across the net and it's, and it's, it's not, it's not as hard as what it, it, it is. I mean, it, look, it sounds harder than what it is. But it's so cool. Right. Up, up, down, and go back a step, then up three strings. You know, it's so, so cool. Maybe we'll demonstrate some of that tonight, but I love that. Just like, and it makes a riff carry across the fretboard, you know, and then do it in a different position. I love it. So, yeah, we'll get into whatever you want to get into because, um, you know, I'm willing to share the information that I have. I mean, that's what I've been doing is writing books about and trying to get all that information out there. That's awesome. So we'll share everything. It's like, here, take this and then do what you can with it. Yeah. You know, here's to work with and then just. Have a good day. <laughs> that's, that's right. Well, we'll give we'll give people a couple little freebies, and then we'll send them your way for your books and things like that as well, too. But I did write that guy's name down because I saw that guy today, the Italian guy, and I'm not going to pronounce the name right, um, but Vittorio Camardesi, Car and he was a radiologist. Like he, yeah, it's like you said, scientist, a radiologist. And what I liked about his style, he was playing like on I, I believe it was a nylon string uh, guitar. Yeah. But he had the real percussiveness like what Eddie would have probably, I, I mean, I've never heard Eddie talk about him ever, ever in an interview, but it was very percussive like you would hear on Mean Street, you know, like a very percussive. Yes. Isn't that yes, cool? Exactly. Yeah. You guys got to look it up. Vittorio yeah. Camardese, I think, C-A-M-A-R-D-E-S-E. -E. Very, very cool. So and back in the 60s, it was a good quality video too, considering, you know, uh, you know the mm -hmm. technology they had back then. But let's, let's jump over to the chat for a quick second again. We'll say hi to a few more people, and we'll come back to some more cool stuff. Uh, Alan oh. Holler is saying uh, hopefully the mixer is working. I blew up my mixer here last week. It went up in a puff of smoke, and I've had it since replaced. So we're good. Uh, Quentin James is here saying, hey, kids. Jason Wade, uh, hey, dude. Uh, Steve Lynch, holy crap, one of my childhood heroes. Freaking awesome. Uh, uh, heroes of, for all of us, for sure. I can't tell you how many times I played, remember on uh, on cassette tape, wearing out, turn up the radio, just rewind that song. And even before I even had the tape, I would record it off my local Detroit radio station and just play it over and over. I mean, talk about a great song. Um, and let's, let's stay on that for a second. Wasn't that a song that the label didn't even want? Yes. RCA didn't really want us to put, on, put it on the record. They thought that the, the song, Singer to Me, should be the first single. They thought that was the strongest one. And we argued with them saying that, hey, look at this one's called Turn Up the Radio. You know, I mean, radio stations are going to absolutely love it. Yeah. And of course they did. So we eventually got our way. You know, we put it on the album, kind of, we kind of snuck around and went to the studio and did it. <laughs> and, and, you know, just, just completely recorded the whole thing. They didn't want us to do that. And so we did it. And then what we did was we went in after they heard it and they went, yeah, that's actually a really good song. Because they had just heard the demo before, but um, uh, what we did was we went into the studio and we did all the call letters for all the different you know stations around the whole U.S. and Canada, saying, "Hey, turn it up, KPZUZ. You know, this is autograph. Turn it up. You know." And and so we went in. It took us two eight-hour days to get all the radio stations, you know, call letters. But it was us doing it, you know, in the studio live. And so 
um, we sent those out to everybody, and every every radio station just played the heck out of it. So it, it was a really good concept to be able to do that. And, and uh, you know, they still do it to this day. Hey, turn it up, you know, and they, they, they crank up that song. Exactly. Now, a lot of bands, sometimes certain songs, you know, I'll, I'll use a band like Extreme. I like Extreme a lot as well, too. Uh-huh. Gary Sharona, you know, a, a Van Halen alumni for, for a short bit there. But sometimes bands get, they kind of hate the songs that, made them hum- uh, like a huge like more than words you know i'm sure the band's kind of like ah you right. know but what did turn it out turn up the radio did it ever bother you in that sense it was you're kind of labeled as that song band or did you love it or it, uh, kind of a mixed emotions on it now looking back you know i think that we have better songs actually commercially i don't know if all of them you know really compared to that mm-hmm. but the fact that there's better produced songs, there's more interesting songs. Like one of my favorites is All I'm Gonna Take. And then okay. there's a lot of songs off the third album. The third album is actually my favorite album, which is um, Loud and Clear. That one was at the peak of our writing and our production. You know, that was when we worked with Andy Johns. And mm-hmm. by that time, you know, all of us were pretty good um, engineers and producers ourselves, you know, because previous to Autograph, we were in the studio a lot like like when we got signed in basically 84 i was 29 years old so i'd already had a lot of experience in the studio and so were the other guys the other guys were actually a few years older than me you know except for kenny the drummer he was he was a year younger than me but all the other guys were three years older than me and so we had had tons of studio experience and so when we came together it went really fast kind of like a almost like a total thing where everybody had they, we weren't session players, but we had had a lot of uh, studio experience previously. Yeah, there's I've tried, and, and doing some research, it's cool that you mentioned Toto because um, I, I don't have the full facts, but both you and Steve Lukather had did something for, was it, for, for what, I want to say Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, or no, yes. was it? Yes. And it, But it didn't make it, to the, didn't make it, but still you were there in this. That was my first recording gig after uh, I graduated from the Guitar Institute. Okay. And I think it was um, possibly Tommy Tedesco. Oh, wow. Institute, who, who turned me on to that. He said, hey, you know, Greg Lake from Emerson, Lake and Palmer is looking for a guitar player. Oh. And heard your demo that you did at the Guitar Institute. And he really wants you to come in and lay down some tracks. So I ended up laying down some tracks. And um, they had um, other people come in, too. Um, one of them was Steve Lukather. And I think what they ended up doing was they scrapped the whole album because there was there was a lot of uh, drugs and booze going on in the studio, <laughs> and they had they'd spent a ton of money, and they weren't sure which direction they were going in. And you know, Greg Lake's such an uh, emotional singer and, and great writer, but uh, I think what they initially did was they got Gary Moore to come in and just do the whole album with them. Oh wow! So going in so many fragmented directions, you know, having all these different players on the whole thing, which I thought was cool. Yeah, you know. Um, um, I don't know if they ever used any of them. I never heard the album. I don't know if they ever used any of the stuff. I only played on two or three songs on the album. But what they a, our players come in. What a cool experience. I mean, the, the sole fact, too, that obviously being, a, um, you know, you talk about your guys' uh, age at that time. You know, you were kind of not like to, like like the 18, 20 year olds. You know, you'd seen a lot of these gigs. You're kind of seasoned pros at that point. So that works very, yeah. very well going to a studio. Bang, bang, bang. You're saving the studio a lot of money. You're the hero. You know, I mean, they want to pay you as little as they can anyways, I'm sure, you know, to get the right. job done. But you saved the studio a lot of money. So probably uh, your name was probably a favorite in the Rolodex of people to call on quite a bit. Yeah, I got quite a few calls uh, for different soundtracks and stuff. I played on this. Uh, oh, God. Uh, this Japanese, I think her name was uh, uh, Tamiko or something like that. And okay. I played on a few of her albums. And she was popular, really popular in Japan at the time. But she was doing all the recording at Dapplin Studios in North Hollywood. And uh, so I was called in quite a bit on that one. And just a, a variety of stuff. You know, just it goes on and on and on. So, um, but I'd come in and lay down a track or two. They just they just liked me because I was I sounded so different from everybody else. That's cool, Yeah. That's the thing. That's probably a piece That's of advice. The thing is people really recognize, you know, when you stand out, when you have your own thing, you don't have to be really fast. The thing is, is be really unique and innovative and very tasty in, in what you play against the song. And you're going to get calls left and right. Just like with Steve Lukather. I mean, look at look, Steve Lukather, how much he works. He works a ton, you know, and uh, because he's just a really tasty player and he knows exactly what to play for each different song. And he's really fast in the studio. Same thing with, you know, Lee Rettenauer and, 
and Larry Carlton and all these guys that um, are, have been heavy duty session players for years and years. That's fantastic. Um, I, I'd love to hear some of these sessions. I would just love to be a fly in the wall. I mean, if we, we may not get to hear all of them, um, but if there's some out there, bootleg somewhere, I'd love to discover some of these. It'd be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. A uh, couple couple more comments here, and we'll jump back over to some more questions here. Nocturnal Butterfly, that's my better half. She's running the chat here very efficiently. She's saying, hi, all. Uh, Ricky Mees, hey, everyone. Let me see. Connor is here. Scott Connor. Fender Guru is here. Uh, Sean Close. Um, John Kerry, is, he's saying that might be a Kiesel, but I know it's not a Kiesel. What guitar are you playing at the moment? That's a new, as a new signature? This is a Roberts guitar. It's a uh, Dale Roberts lives up in Jacksonville, Florida. Just has a little shop up there. But I went up there, and I... Uh, was uh, looking at, uh, you know, because uh, Jimmy Bell, you know who Jimmy Bell is, just a mm-hmm. monster player. Yep. And uh, uh, he told me about uh, about uh, Dale. And so I went up and checked out a shop, and we came up with this one here. And I have a couple of them now. Um, but you can see how thin the body is. Yeah. I'm on full screen right now, you can see how thin the body is and how contoured the back is. See, all this is carved out back here. So you, even up at the 24th fret, you don't feel anything up here. Nice. Got a super skinny neck, you know, maple neck on the front, ebony on the on the uh, for the fingerboard, and um, it's uh, just got a couple high output pickups actually from Dean. It's it's like the um, God, I can't remember the name of them, but mm-hmm. they're they're just super high output, and we got Floyd Rose Pro on it, and and uh, but it just plays and it's really light and it just plays like better than any guitar I've ever played because I just. I kept on telling him, no, let's take more off here. Let's take more off here. Let's make this thing just like a speed machine so that it plays itself. And there's no finish on the back of the neck, none whatsoever. Nice. So that's why I like it. I like to feel bare wood back there. I can't play a guitar with painting on it, you know, with, with a finish on the back because I sweat so much on stage, my hands start sticking. So that yep. just doesn't work for me. Now, now, the only thing you might find, and I find with some of my unfinished necks, sometimes if you play, I know you've done like the Monsters of Rock Cruises and things like that, but maybe some festivals where there's extreme humidity, it can also work against you a little bit with an unfinished neck. Do you find that sometimes? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, when you're out on a ship and you're playing outside, Ooh. you're going to get affected by it. You know what I mean? So, and I, well, I live in Florida anyway, but, yep. <laughs> but um, you know, I'm in an air conditioned place right here. So that makes the big difference. But yeah, the humidity can definitely affect you. And it's also the ocean air, just the salt in the air too. Yeah, that'd be, yeah, I've never experienced that like playing wise. So I wouldn't know, but I know I played some outdoor gigs where it gets, you know, damp at night and you're like, Oh my, my neck feels like a sponge almost. Right. Exactly. Yeah. No, I've, I've seen that guitar and actually I think it was on the monsters of rock cruise. I seen you've been playing the Dean's, you know, as you're, cause you're a Dean artist. Um, are you, are you still an artist on the roster there? Artist on the what? On the Dean roster? Are you still a Dean artist as well? Well, you know, um, I'm looking at going to a different place right now because they have some guitarists that I'm really interested in. Cool. I just want them to make... The, it has like the Sustaniac in it, which I'm a big fan of, mm-hmm. and it's all built into the guitar. So I'm looking at actually going with them. We have been with Dean for a few years, but um, they seem to be going more for the real, you know, the guys that are the heavy... Uh, seven string players and everything, the real heavy, heavy, the rusty stuff. coolies but, of the world and stuff like that. Yeah. And so that's, you know, so, um, I want a company that will be more into building my specific yeah. guitar. You know, and, and, um, so I'm, I'm talking with a, a company right now, as a matter of fact. Well, that's cool. Well, this one that you just showed us here, which is really cool about when you showed us the side profile, it kind of reminded me just, you know, I'm just going to make a couple comparisons, you know, the, um, kind of the midline Kramers back in the day when they were like very Mm -hmm. thin. And then also Ibanez as well too, which became like the Satriani and things like that. Um, very, very, very thin. Like, you know, it's almost, you wonder how you can get a Floyd Rose block in those things. Right. Exactly. Well, um, I used to play, I had an S series, you know, when they first came out, mm-hmm. the Ibanez S series, that was the real slim model. This one's even skinnier than that. But, um, uh, when back in the day, I always used Kalers. Yeah, I remember that. Because the fact that they would just fit on the top and they stayed in tune really, really well. And, um, of course you don't have to cut the balls of the strings off and, and clamp them down in there and everything. You just pop it in and string it up and it's, it's super fast. And, uh, uh, I just, I never had a problem with the sustain at all. A lot of people complained about the sustain with it because it wasn't through body and everything. You didn't have it connected to springs like an old Stratocaster or something, you know? So it was all just self-contained with these really heavy duty little springs on the inside. You know what Kalos are like. Oh, well, of course you do. And so, you know, I just, um, I would have stayed with them uh, actually, but you know, when uh, I started having guitars made for me, like 
everybody said, well, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of tough to make it for Kayla. And I'm going, well, you don't have to, you don't have to gut them out on the back or anything. Yeah. I mean, it's just all flush now. You know, you just have to, you know, uh, carve out that little, little spot in the front for it to fit into. And that's it. So do you think, do you th- not to make it go back with Kayla actually? Yeah. Do you, do you think it's a, a, a unfair comparison or maybe a close, accurate comparison that Kaler was the beta and Floyd is the VHS? You know, like, yes. you know, maybe better in some ways, but the marketing, yeah. the marketing just wasn't there, whereas Floyd, you know, it just took off. Right. And it's funny because I, I met uh, Floyd Rose in Seattle. Mm-hmm. And uh, this was back in, when we were playing, I was playing at a group called Silverload back up there in the, the mid 70s. And we were one of the more popular Seattle bands at the time. And Floyd Rose came up to me in between songs, and he was really drunk. And he was, I was playing a Strat, and um, he says, hey, man, I can make that thing sound so much better, man. It, it'll stay in tune perfectly and everything. I just have this and this to it. And it was a 62 Strat. I'm going, no way. I'm not going to have you carve up my Strat. You know, and so basically, you know, um, but he was drunk. And th- yeah. we eventually had him thrown out. Oh my God! And then years later, I'm remembering that name, Floyd Rose, because it's such an unusual name. Of course. And, um, then I went, "Oh wait, he's that guy in Seattle that we had thrown out of the club because he was drunk and obnoxious. He was bugging us between every song." And I, I told him the story when I it was at a Nam show. You know, he just busted up laughing. He goes, "That was you guys," and I said, "Yeah, that was us." You know, so I thought it was pretty funny. That's a very funny story. I'll, I'll share a very quick anecdote with you that I, this is one of those ones where you got to be careful what you say because you never know who you're talking to. You may know right. you may know this story, but there's a guitar pick that I use. This brand of guitar pick is called Dava, and they're not for everybody, but I swear by them. And depending on how you hold them, it's a, basically a one gauge for everybody. Depending on where you hold them, they choke up. There's a different gauge to them. And the the owner's name is uh, of the company is Dave Story. And I've been working with Dava since 2000, and I love him to death. But we're having a conversation early into our relationship, and I was like, I don't know how we started talking about tremolos, but I was like, oh, yeah, Kaler, oh, man, oof, Kaler, you know, yuck. And he goes, did you know I was a co-inventor of Kaler, co-founder? And I'm like, oh. And he was like, you're just looking for someone to bail you out of this conversation, right? Because I had just complained about how, how bad it was. But yeah, he's a Dave story, and I don't know who the other fellow was, but there was two people. They were the co-founders of Kaler. And, you know, certainly it would, like I say, we go back to that beta and VHS, you know, they, they, I don't think the dive bombs were as nice necessarily on Kaler as on a Floyd, but they certainly were a good tremolo. They stayed in tune and, you know, it it is what it is. And you could set them up. See, I could get more of a dive bomb effect out of it to the point where the strings were completely slacked, you know, just completely loose and flopping around, you know, but it depends on how you set it up. Okay. And I've yeah. never, I've never owned a true Kaler. I had some courts back in the day that were copies. Uh, mm-hmm. They had a Kaler copy, and they were horrible. The copies, um, but it yeah. was the same idea. And then, um, you know, there, you know, another Tremolo that came out right around that time too. What was it the uh, the Washburn? Was it the Wonder Bar or something like that? No, is that what it was called? Right. right yeah. yeah. So, and they, that was kind of between. You had Kaler. You had Steinberger eventually with a trans trim. You had the Wonder Bar and a Floyd right. Rose. The Steinberger trims. I like those. And then. Um, the Parker Fly had their own trim. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Remember the Parker guitars? Yeah. They stayed in tune nice. Yeah. Yeah. And look at what's on so the PR. I, I mean, I didn't mean to get down this rabbit hole of Tremolos, but look at PRS as well, too. Their um, mm-hmm. vintage Strat style uh, floating bridge uh, stays in tune quite nice as well. Like, I've got one that's uh, it's just a typical Strat style bridge, but it floats and has locking right. tuners on it. Not a locking nut, but locking tuners. And you can, you can dive bomb, and as long as you pull back a little bit, the guitar stays in tune pretty damn good. Right. You see, that's the problem was when I first started using Floyd's, I noticed a lot of times when you dive bomb, come back up, you'd have to pull up to get it to go right back in tune. Now, you're talking more about a Kaler or are you talking about the Floyd? Well, I'm talking about I'm talking about the Kalers in that case. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. I've never had that problem with the Kaler. I have had that with the Floyd before. OK. And I what I was doing was this pinching down here. Yep. You know what I mean? Where the, where the slot goes into uh, against the uh, the bolt that goes down into the guitar itself. Yeah. It, Pinching somehow because it'd make that popping sound. Ping, a little ping, yep. And right. All, yeah, and it, I think what happens is you can wear a groove into that eventually. And so once that once you do that, then the the, the bolts, you know, the, they're basically useless after that. You have to get new bolts. And so that's what I did and it worked fine after that. But that's the only time I'd had a problem with it. Um with the cater, I never had that problem of having to pull it back up again. You oh, know, that's always, cool. When I brought it back up from a dive, it always came right back up. 
That's what they always tell you too with the Floyds, especially you know if you're going to adjust your your height on your bridge, don't do it with. Spr- and I'm I I've done this. I'm against all suggestions not to do this. You know I I never listen, uh, but I've never really ruined a guitar doing it. But you know if I'm in a hurry to set my action on my Floyd, you know you're supposed to uh-huh. take the string te- string tension off because there's so much pressure on those those bolts that you're you're hurting your knife edges as you're lowering that. But, uh, right. you know, back in the day, everyone was using like, you know, this is long before the days of the nut sauce and all that kind of stuff you put on. It would just be like Vaseline or graphite or any kind of, you know, stuff. And they'd put that literally on the bolts, on the right. knife edge to keep it smooth. You know, just so. What it, I do is I, I put graphite mixed with Vaseline. Okay. You know, uh, with, with like a toothpick. Yep. And uh, then I dab it in. I'd loosen up the strings and pop them out of the nut. And then I put them in, into the slot on the nut. And that seemed to help out for quite a bit. I mean, because, of course, when you're using a non-locking system, what's going to happen is that's where it goes out of tune. Is usually the G-string itself, actually, always, is the one that always gets stuck. But that puts the whole guitar out of tune if you're on a floating system. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Once you go to, once it once it's off uh, kilter, you know, you're sharp right. or, or whatever, yeah. yeah. And then remember they had that little micro-rolling nut where they were actually on wheels? Yep. Remember that one? I do. I remember I that. It was Buzzy Feeton. Buzz Feeton, yep. Yep. yep, that uh, that actually discovered that. The Buzz Feetin tuning system, and then and they had the rolling nope. out, yeah. That was, and, yeah, it was Buzzy Feetin that, that actually developed that. Fender Fender used something for a while uh, at the same time, around that time as well, too. Uh, and there's, I don't know what to call it, the Super Strat, or Strat Plus, I think they call it. They had like a roller nut as well, which was kind of cool. And it did uh-huh. it did help a little bit with the tuning. And a little tip I can share with people, too, that always works, uh, I find, even with Floyd's, that um, I know a lot of cases, you, you your Floyd pulls backwards, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, because you do a lot of yeah, the crazy pullback. I have to be able to pull way up on it too, because that's in a lot of my techniques. Is that I have to pull way up beyond pitch. Yeah. You know, beyond the standard place where you're tuned at, and so um, I have to have a lot of downward room to, to go down a pitch, and I have to have a lot of room to go upward in pitch as well. Now you're not. You're not. I thought at one time you said you were playing eights. You don't play eights anymore, do you? Eight gauge. I don't play that. Eight gauge strings. No. Uh-uh. What are you at, 9 to 42? 9 through 42. Okay. But it's like 8-gauge eight, eight, eight almost because we're tuned down a whole step. That's true. Yeah, the slinkiness, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's a really light feel, mm-hmm. you know, but, um, I, you know, I just, it's a lot easier on my hands. And the one thing that, you know, at the age I'm at, you know, I'm a very aggressive player. I pick hard and I play really hard with my left hand and my right hand. You know, when I'm, when I'm hammering on, I, I really hit it. I'm not a light player at all. Right. And so it's, it's beating up my hands quite a bit. So if I play with heavy gauge strings, my hands start freezing up. It just doesn't work, you know, because of all the abuse I've given them over the last, well, 50 years now. Yeah. Why, why work so hard if you don't have to, right? Don't fight right. those, you know, exactly. like, you don't have to be Steve Ray. I started playing, you know, to get out a lot of the, you know, the harmonics and everything, the pinch harmonics when I was into that and everything, I I just always had a really, really heavy approach, just like uh, uh, kind, of like, kind of like Stevie Ray Vaughan, but he he played um, with, I think, 12. Yeah, stupid. Crazy. The super heavy ones, and I'm just going, God, I just don't know how he does that well. And he's also an aggressive player. Mm-hmm. He plays really heavy with his left hand. And I think growing up, listening to blues guys and how they dig into it, you know, and everything. And there's their vibrato and just how aggressively they're picking. Um, it's a lot different from the guys that you see that are, that are really picking light and their left hands, you know, like barely moving, but it's going a million miles an hour. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that's, I've learned a completely different way. You know, I mean, it, it helped ease off a little bit when I was, when I was going to the guitar Institute, because I said, Oh, you're, you're playing totally wrong. You can't have your thumb up over the top of the neck at all. It always has to be right back in the middle of the neck. I'm going, I can't bend the string that way. And I, I can't vibrato it. It just doesn't work. I know. You know? Um, and they understood that because, uh, you know, when I tried to show them things like don't vibrato it back and forth, try to, but bending it up and down to get the vibrato. Mm-hmm. And, I said, bend it and hold that pitch while you're giving it vibrato. And these guys had the hardest time doing that. They go, wow, this is a lot harder than I thought. Because I just that that bending with your third finger and holding that note and pitch up a whole step while giving it vibrato. God, I spent months on that alone to be able to perfect that. You know, with with having a slower vibrato, you know, instead of the fast vibrato that sounds like you're nervous. Rather yeah, than yeah. 
they're, they're paranoid rather than actually giving it vibrato. You know, you got to relax. The vibrato has to go with the tempo of the song, basically. And you have kind of have to think about that when you're using vibrato. Yeah. Here's something I know you'll appreciate, and I know you'll agree with this. About I'm thinking it's probably about two or three months back, somewhere around that neighborhood, I had Paul Gilbert on the show and uh-huh. talk about a king of vibrato. And one of the tips, I, I try to remember a really cool takeaway from every guest. And some ca- some guests, there's, there's so many that I can't remember them all. But And he gave us a lot, too. But he says, always be vibrato ready. So... Wherever you're coming out of, going into, be be vibrato ready, and I, I that really yeah. stuck in my head. You know, be you know, yeah. plan it and be ready for it. Yes, absolutely. Because you can't really end a phrase on a dead note. No, no. You know, you either have to use your vibrato arm to bring it somewhere, or you have to give it some vibrato, or you have to slide it or something. You know, but you can't uh, you can't just end on a on a dead note and just hold it like that. It just doesn't. It doesn't. There's no emotion in it. Vibrato is emotion. Yeah. You know, and and a re- having a really good vibrato and the right choice of notes, you know, that's that's what emotion's all about. That's right. And you were just a moment ago. You're talking about you know uh, you know positioning and your hand and with the thumb and whether some players you got the thumb over the neck and holding it and, and using the thumb as a capo or a chord. One of right. the people that we talked about earlier, one of your uh, your heroes growing up, obviously Harvey Mandel. I didn't even really know any of his stuff until today, and he's got uh-huh. some of the stuff he was doing. He's not even using his thumb whatsoever. He's doing some vibrato with his thumb not on the neck of the guitar. And try that sometime for people out there that are trying to try to do some crazy stuff without your thumb. It is very, very weird. Your thumb is a very strong part of your hand. And I saw some of the stuff he was doing, these taps, and he had no thumb grip whatsoever. Isn't that weird? Yeah, wow. Yeah, he's he like he's, he reaches up. You can actually see his thumb off the neck on the back, and he's doing these crazy little bend things with no strength of the thumb. I don't know how he was doing it, but he does it phenomenal. Wow. Yeah, these are just some I of the old... I never noticed that about his playing. Yeah, check you it know, out. And, and that's the thing about innovation um, is just coming up with something just, just so off the wall. And I think that's what Alan Holsworth did. See, Alan Holsworth was... Um, he was also a sax player and a violin player. So he was used to the, more of that legato sound. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that that played into his, his uh, really fluid technique. But there was a guy when I was going to the Guitar Institute... Uh, this guy Peter, he was from Australia, and he was playing a 335. So they had the um, the bridge, you know, and then the tailpiece back here. Well, on the strings back in between the bridge and the tailpiece, he put those little tiny like stirring straws. Mm-hmm. He put them on the strings, cut them to length, and put them on back there. And then he was doing bending while he was picking. He was using his other fingers to bend the pitches of those notes. One would go a whole step, and one would go a half step, and I went. This is incredible. It sounds like he's playing a slide, a pedal steel guitar. Yeah. You know, he just had the technique down so well. You know, it, he's, you know, nobody could figure out what he was doing and nobody sounded like him at all. You like, know, and, and, but he really stood out. He ended up getting a lot of studio stuff from his technique, you know, because he just sounded so different. Like a B bender on multiple strings. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Isn't that cool? So, so many little tiny things out there. It's, it's yeah. so neat. Just when we think we've come up with something new, there's always someone that's done something similar. Um, back over to the chat, just for a quick second. Phoenix Venervaden says, uh, hey there, good evening. Uh, great to see Steve on the show. I learned my tapping from him. Uh, Tesla Troops is here. John Carey, I think I mentioned that about the Kiesel earlier. He was asking about that. Uh, Sean Close says, same guitar you were playing last Saturday. Uh, Neil Banbury is here. Row Camp 56. Bobby Clifford Bresbo, he picked up a new Wolfgang today. Awesome. Good to hear. Chris Kerr is here. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, lots of we got a lot of uh, Wolfgang uh, fans on the show, obviously, with uh, Van Halen. Yeah. Uh, Poon Ninja is here. Funny name. We love him. He's great. Scott Roos is here. Um, let me see. Connor, did you hear um, uh, the Dave and Eddie Broadway show? I did hear about that. Yeah, they're doing some kind of a Broadway show. It's off-Broadway, whatever, the the uh-huh. relationship between David Lee Roth and Eddie Van Halen. That should be... It's not the real people, obviously, actors. Uh, that should be an interesting um, show. Yeah, no, <laughs> well, we were, on, we were on the last tour with with David and Eddie. Yeah, I mean, when David was still yep. in the, in the, the 1984 album. And uh, it was in 1984 year, and I'm sure they named that after George Orwell's book. But uh, uh, but anyway, yeah, they're they weren't getting along really well. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah, that, that's I'm glad you mentioned that too for the whole fact. And there's I know there was some tension on that tour between the bands. I mean, we won't go down that rabbit hole either. Um, not that it was of your fault. 
Um, but David Lee Roth obviously had a lot to do, um, you know, hearing the demo tape, right? And when you guys were picked up for the tour, didn't you actually on the way to your first gig was, and I, I could be completely wrong and, and I'm, I'm not ashamed to say I will be wrong. Didn't you name the band on the way to the, one of the first gigs? Yeah, that's right. Wow. We, like- um, we each wrote down, uh, like in the, in the back of the Winnebago that we were driving from Los Angeles all the way to Jacksonville, Florida, straight across on the I-10 all the way across. And uh, we we didn't have a name for the band because we were actually just guys that got together and jammed together. We just put together some songs because we were signed with different artists. Like me and the keyboard player with, were with uh, Holly Penfield on Dreamland Records. And um, Steve Pluckett, the singer, was with Silver Condor with Earl Slick on Columbia Records. Kenny uh, Richards, the drummer, was playing... Um, with a group called The Coup on A&M Records, and Randy Rand was playing with Lita Ford, wow. our bass player. He was playing with Lita Ford at the time. So um, we just were guys that got together and jam. We went into the studio. Andy Jones, producer Andy Jones, came down to one of our rehearsals and said, you guys got some really tasty stuff that you've written on your own. He says, I got some free time at, at, um, at Gower Studios down in Hollywood. And he says, why don't we go down and cut us a five-song demo? So we did. We did it on, on. We did all five songs on one day, and then we we mixed them on the second day, and uh, that's you know how word about us kind of started getting around. But we still didn't have a name, mm-hmm. and um, so Kenny, <clears throat> our drummer, was jogging every morning with David Lee Roth. He gave them that demo, a copy of that demo, and um, they went back and listened to it. You know, at David's place after they got done jogging, and David loved it, and he said. Kenny, you want to go out on tour? Why don't you guys come out on tour with us for the 1984 tour? We don't have anybody yet. And Kenny said, yeah, we'd love to, absolutely love to. But the problem is everybody was with already signed with another label. Oh, know, boy. In a different group. So what we did at the next rehearsals, we got together and we started talking about it and everything. We just thought, you know, we're already done recording with these other bands. You know, we've already got to that. We're not touring out there with them. I thought, you know, what the heck, let's just... Put together a band we'll think of a name and then we'll go out and just play these songs you know and that, we wrote a couple more songs so we'd have a full set and uh we went out like i said we borrowed money to, and we got a winnebago and drove across the united states and got to that first gig and started playing and that's what led to the rca record signing deal because we were opening up for van halen we had all these record companies you know warner brothers and Geffen and and a and m and everything and everybody was showing up Epic, epic records was always there and so um but RCA offered us the best deal, and we actually signed our record deal backstage at Madison Square Gardens. What a story, man. So, yeah, it's just kind of like a Cinderella story. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, obviously, yeah, that, that was starting to look good on the resume. Who's this uh, this, this band here? Who are these guys who are yeah. opening for Van Halen? And obviously, some of the festivals and things. And that, so just... At that point, when we made up the name, we just, we just picked the name Autograph out of all the names that we wrote down because we thought, well, we kind of have a signature sound. Okay. You know, we don't sound like anybody, so let's just call it autograph for now. You know, that's what stuck out, and so we just. But then once we played in front of so many people, we were kind of stuck with that name. Of course, we played in, in front of hundreds of thousands of people during five month period. You know, because each show was a like basically an eighteen twenty to twenty one thousand seater, and um, so and they were all sold out so we played in a lot you know over those five months we played in front of a lot of people so we decided to keep it did you on that tour did uh because here in canada the 84 tour in montreal i didn't get to see that show i did i did see uh van halen every year from 84 through detroit places like that uh uh-huh. it's closer to we me played to, with them in detroit did not in montreal though right yeah, uh, whereabouts cobal hall Co- or maybe it was joe lewis Co- cobal hall i think it was but i think it was cobal hall yeah yeah. So yeah, okay, but you didn't do the Canadian leg at all with them. Mm-hmm. Yep. You, you did. You did do some of the Canadian oh, tours. Not, no, we didn't play in Canada. Oh, okay, there you go. I was just just curious. No, we we only played the furthest north we got was, you know, of course New York and uh, Detroit and some other upper Midwest places and upper Northeast places. That's it. You know, like Boston, Philly, and all that. So. So at that point of that tour, that was probably the biggest audience that you you and your professional career at that point had ever played with. Yes, most definitely. Yeah. Now, was there so, any nerves? It was nerves? exciting. It was a little bit nerve-wracking yeah. getting up on a, you know, our first show was in front of 18,500 people. Oh. You know, we had never played a live show together before. Yeah. So. And, 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 and I mean, I, I always hold the, the dearest respect of Van Halen, and I never talk negative of them on the show, and we'll, we'll dance around this very delicately. I understand that, you know, 
you didn't get to fully explore everything that you would have loved, loved to have done as a band, really prove yourselves. It was a little bit of a leash that you were kept on a little bit. Um, yeah. Um, what happened was right before, actually, like a half hour before we went on stage, I was told that I can't use that technique. That's Eddie's thing. And I thought, well, you know, I told him, I said, look, I wrote a book about it before I even heard of the guy. Mm-hmm. You know, so um, I said, it's, it's not really his thing. There was other people doing it. I mentioned Harvey Mandel and, and the Johnny Smith from back in the um, back in the 30s and everything. And, and so, but... The person that came up and said that said, no, you're not allowed to do that on this tour because that's that's Eddie's thing. And um, so I kind of just had to wing it because I had all these solos pre-written out. Yeah. And it was the tour manager that told me I couldn't do it. So it didn't come from Eddie. Yeah. It might have come from Eddie. You know what I mean? But yep. it was the tour manager that related to me that I couldn't use the technique on the tour. Sadly, you're probably talking to a, a brick wall at the time if you're talking to a tour manager. I mean, no disrespect, but tour manager yeah. doesn't know Harvey Mandel from Howie Mandel. You know what I mean? Absolutely not. Yeah. So I have to think they're, of it. Like, they're there to watch out for the for the, the benefit of the band, and that's it. Yep. And that's understandable. You know, the, you, yeah. you were the opening band, and we've all been there. And it's not a, it's much as it's cool for us in the moment, the, they don't really don't care about you, they, no, no matter who it is. Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. But that's cool, though. I mean, I, I mean, that's not cool, but it's a cool fact that that was a great exposure for you. Proved yourself worthy. Record contracts, uh, you know, seeking you out nowadays. The labels are like next to nothing. You know, it's all self promotion, self, you know, funded indie crowdfunding, all this stuff. We don't have it like back in the day. Right, exactly. It was it was very beneficial to us. So you know, I can't say anything bad about you know being on the tour, of course. You know, that's right. Yeah. Uh, the, the person we hung out with most was Michael Anthony. He'd always walk off stage with that Jack Daniels bass on, and he would he'd be carrying a, a full bottle of Jack Daniels, and uh, and he would uncork and he said that or un, unscrew it, and he would say that that's not that's not going back on top of the bottle until you know until we all leave here. That bottle's going to be empty. That's sure great. Every time he came over, it was empty. You know. That's hilarious. So, yeah, I've I've heard you say good things about him. I've read a lot of interviews with you, and he's always kind of like the uh, the jewel feel life of the party. Oh yeah, most definitely. Yeah, yeah. Michael's just a really down to earth, easy going guy. He's just a lot of fun to be with. And was, I I saw him about eight months ago when he was down here with Sam Hager. Sam Hager, I went and stopped in and said hi to him and hung out on the side of the stage with him while he was playing. Kept on running over and, and doing shots with me, and then going back out again. And so it was it was really cool to see him. That yeah. I mean, that guy could hold his liquor. He would, you know, he would have a lot to drink yeah. at the night of uh, evening, and he was he's still going. I mean, it's it's amazing how much he could drink. I mean, it's just like I'm going. I I'd be out on the floor. I know. You know? And he's not a big guy. I mean, he's he's a stocky guy, but he's not a tall guy. He's not a big frame dude. You, you know, you'd yeah, think, you'd think he'd be passing not- out. I've ate, he shorted me. So. <laughs> wow. And that's something. Yeah. That, I know I've met him before too. And I, I was qu- quite taller. I'm six two. So, and I was kind of, oh, okay, yeah. yeah, it was, it was interesting. And I was taller yeah. than Eddie and that made me happy too. You know, taller than your hero. That's kind of a neat feature, you know, but right. that's my only, only, only bragging right that I can say. That's I've got yeah. nothing else to say, but listen, we're, we've uh, talked quite a bit here. Let's d- hop into some fun stuff. And I'm going to, I'm going to give you one request for some lessons. And um, just because I know this will get me some thumbs up, I want you to show the guitar players out there something simple that they can show off to their girlfriends and impress their girlfriends. And then they're going to come back and they're going to love me forever for doing it. And then you can, okay. and then I'm going to leave it in your talented hands to give us something that you think would really appreciate and we could really learn and benefit from. So you can, you can take okay. it from there. Well, I think uh, one of the easiest things probably to do would be um, let's take like, the root position for E minor pentatonic, you know, and that would be, um, you know, just that regular, uh, uh, you know, root position where it's up on the 12th fret. Now, this is one of the things I learned was when when you're playing it, this is one of the first things I did actually, was I started going, well, you can play that first position, but then that on the second position. You know, and you can just do that. You can do it right down the neck. So you play. But then your right hand up here is going up to the next position. It's playing. You know, so it, it actually makes it a really easy thing. So I'm just hammering off my right hand first, pulling off to my first finger, and then. 
hammer down with my third finger. So then I go, and then I do the same thing again, but I do a pull off to my third finger and then pull off. So there's a lot of things that you and that's just all playing, you know, just with the pentatonic position. Now, if you want to get a little bit fancier, then you can go up to the next position above that. Which, okay, like say for instance, if we played this descending in fifths. Now we're still on the E minor pentatonic. Right? <laughs> descending down the pattern, you know, the pattern with each different hand, you know, one being, you know, the root position for E minor pentatonic and then the next one to two above that. And then another one that's kind of easy to play, um, but it takes a little bit of time getting used to the coordination. That, and that is when you're doing, like, say, for instance, you're playing E minor pentatonic again. We'll stay on this because if we jump around different keys, it makes it a lot more difficult to understand. Sure. OK, now this is what we're looking at. I'm going to use my second finger for all the notes that are on the 12th fret. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the second finger on my right hand for all the notes that are on the 15, 14, 14, 14, and 15. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit that first one. My second finger is already gonna be in place here, but I'm gonna hit that first note. Then once I get to the top of the neck, I'm gonna pull it off. Slide that one up. Then I'm going to go to the second string. 15, 12, 14, 12, 14, 12, 14, 12. See what I mean? So it kind of gives it a cool sound. I like that a lot. Hand over hand. That's very cool. And uh, so there's a lot of different things you can do with that. Um, one of the things that I, I started messing around with years ago was how to get um, a real, you know, kind of a fluttery sound off of the strings. Um, and that's what I'll, I'll, I'll play it down here. I'm going to play it on the A note down up on the uh, third string on the third, uh, on the second fret. And then what I'm going to do on top of it is I'm going to get my right finger, my second finger, I'm going to go over the top of the string like that, just brushing it. And now listen to the effect you have to go. See what I mean? It gets a weird sound. It's not like you're going like this. But you can hear that. You can hear it going up each fret. But with this, it just sounds very chromatic, like you're hitting all the polytones in between. Yeah. See what I mean? There's a whole different sound to it. I like that. But that's the descending, whichever way you want to do it. And um, another one that I like to play, let's, let's go into like E Aeolian, which is also A Dorian, whichever one you want to play it in. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do like a little sweep here where it goes. So it's just the third finger on the 14th, the second finger on the second string on the, on the uh, 13th, and the first finger on the, uh, on the 12th one. So I'm going like this. And then I'm going to hammer off my third finger I'm going to, to, the, to the first string on the 14th fret. Then I'm going to take my right hand and I'm going to go 15, 14, 12, 15, 13, 12, 14, 12, 11, 14, 12, 10, 14, 12, 10, 11. because of the fact that it's really legato. Mm -hmm. You're just playing out of, you know, E Aeolian, but uh, it gives it a whole different sound. I love so, that. There's, there's one technique you did. Um, I think it's what you do in your solo spot. You do a bit of hammerhead, right? Um, when you do your solo spot with the band. 
And there's this technique you did. I'm going to just try to describe it. It's almost like you're walking down the fretboard with your finger, but you... you would... Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. That when, um, okay, so it's it's basically out of A Dorian is what I'm, I'm playing a lot of it. And a lot of it's a, a minor pentatonic that I'm playing the solo out of. But what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm going up and I'm doing this. You can't have a pick in your mouth, but no. I'm going... Now, what I'm doing basically is I'm bending up, and you got to you got to think that once you're bent up, then you got to lower the scale down. When you're bent up a whole step, you got to lower the scale down. The notes that you're playing above it, okay, down a whole step. You see, because you want it to still fit into the scale, but you're playing that scale, but it's down a whole step. So when I do that. Then I pull off, I just flick it away. Then I have to do it. It gets kind of a cool effect, you know, when you're when you're doing that. So um it's like when you, if you were to hear it on record, you'd have one hell of a time figuring it out. What's it's going on? You have to watch the person doing it. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So that's that's and a... then, uh, There's also a spot on Hammerhead uh, that, that I use in my solo. This is from Hammerhead also, and that's taking. Okay, I'm, I'm right here. I'm, I'm playing. So I'm playing basically the 15th fret on the high E string. I'm playing the. The, fourth, or the 13th fret on the B string, and then I'm playing the 12th fret on the, um, on, the, on the G string. Okay, so now this is what I'm doing, is I'm going. You see, I'm copying the pattern with my right hand. So it's actually going then down a fifth, or uh, down a fifth, then down a fourth. And then I'm, doing, I'm copying the same thing from my right hand, but I'm doing it on... The 17th, the 15th, and the 14th. I'm sorry, the 19th, the 17th, and the 16th. So I'm going. Okay. Now, when you speed that up, it sounds very interesting. just really um it's going down chromatic see what i'm doing I'm going... stuff like that so it gives it a different different sound because the intervals are spread further apart. Mm -hmm. It's just like almost as if you did, okay, let's go back to uh, the minor pentatonic again, but let's do this in A minor. Let's play in octave dispersion. Okay, so now what I would do is I'd play this. I would I would play, for instance, like with my right hand, here's A minor pentatonic up on the, uh, up on the uh, 12th and 15th fret. <laughs> I can play the M minor pentatonic in the root position up on the 17th fret. decipher what you're doing because you're hearing these notes just sporadically jump all over the place when you're doing it. But it's a cool effect. I like it.
to you like that. And you really got to get it right now. I'm getting a bit of noise because I don't have the, the muter on the end of the strings. But, um, you know, you can really calm down that extra, you know, string feedback and everything and the, all the extra little notes that are coming out. I was going to ask you about that. Amp. Yeah, I just, it's somewhere in here. I just couldn't find it. But uh, no problem. I was I was going to ask but, if that was a damper. You know, oh, or or else you can do this. The cheap way that I used to do it you know, is I would take my shoe off and take my sock off. Yep. In the studio, and the, you can see, actually see pictures of this, um, where I'm tying the sock around the end of the net when I'm doing my hammer-on parts. You know, um, to keep all the other strings from from sounding out. So yeah. But that's what I first started using. Then eventually, now I have a new design that I've come up with that's adjustable for different size necks. Oh, that's good. So I'm going to be, it's already developed. It's ready to go. So oh, I'm fantastic. The right one, possibly Ernie Ball, because I just, I just signed a deal with them. So nice, nice. Yeah. Before I describe how what I what I envision in my mind what you're, when you're doing the descending stuff that which was very very cool from Hammerhead there I'll tell you in a second what it sounds like I just want to give a big thank you to Jason Wade he just did a super chat and he said um, Steve Lynch Nocturnal Butterfly thanks for this live stream it's so cool to see a Guitar Hero live much appreciated uh, no problem it's, it's nice to be able to have uh, uh, Steve join us tonight and play so what um, so thank you Jason um, when yeah you're absolutely yeah when you're doing that descending thing do you know what it really reminded me of I don't want to say like I, I'm a big sci-fi fan. Uh -huh. Like um, uh, Close Encounters, you know, and you know, I'm even going to go as bold as say, and this might sound a little silly, but E.T., I did enjoy that movie. I just pictured that sound as like in a, in a chase scene in a sci-fi movie or something. That's what I get from it. And you know what they used to do, and this is where I used to get some of my ideas from, is from a keyboard, like a, a, a synth keyboard, or from the violin parts. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I've listened to the violin parts, and I go, God, that's really cool. How would I do that on guitar? Oh, well, it's really actually very hard because you're hearing different violin parts all together. But then you add your, your left hand and or your right hand, and then you, you can do a couple of those parts together, and you can actually, actually be harmonizing with yourself. And that's another thing right there is just being able to harmonize with yourself. See, when you go down a scale, like let's just say, let's just say a, a Dorian. Now, what you can do is you can play that, of course, it, it'll be two notes down from the original. You can See what I mean? But you're, harm you're actually harmonizing with yourself. Yeah. You're playing the harmony note. You know? That's absolutely fantastic. Um, I've got. Yeah, there's simple little ideas like that. You see, it, you can see it's really not that difficult to play. No. It just sounds really cool. Yeah. I was watching another one of your instructions. This goes back to your, like, way back. This goes back to the REH videos. Um, you know, obviously, we talked about Paul Gilbert earlier. He had some great lessons on REH as well. But yeah, I, yeah, he was on REH, too. I was. I did the first, very first video on REH. Oh, that's cool. You're the first guy to yeah. do it. Very first one. That's when Roger Hutchinson of REH actually first got started and asked me to be on the first one. Because I... I knew those guys from Seattle anyway, you know, but I was still living in L.A. because it was after I graduated. It was, oh, God, it was uh, uh, it was eight years after I graduated. I went up October of 87, up, flew back up to Seattle and actually recorded the video up there. That's something I did not know, so I'm very, I've, that's a cool fact I just learned tonight. So the very first guy on the uh, REH video series, that's great. But yeah. where, where I was going with that, I was a comment too. Gussie Wells says, I must tune in, this, uh, tune in more often. Great stream. Thank you. Nice to have you here. I appreciate that. Um, one of the Very techniques cool. you were talking about, and, uh, and I, I, I probably can't retell it exactly the way you said, but for people getting into the two-hand tapping, you were doing something along the lines of just like a two-note per string, and you'd say, now do this all the way across the fretboard with your first finger, then repeat it with your second finger, then your third finger, and your fourth finger while you're getting your fingers trained and strong. Is that something that you would recommend? Like, repeat those patterns? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, okay, like, say, for instance, like, playing just out of that first thing that I did, the... The, the um, E minor pentatonic, uh, you can use your first finger. You can use your second finger then. Hold your third finger on your right hand. Fourth finger. And that's what you want to do. It's sort of a little string noise, but. Uh, that's okay. But um, yeah, that's basically one of the things you want to do. Now, another thing is this. This is a really good exercise, and I came up with this quite a while ago. And that is just playing, like, um, say, for instance, on the third string, I'm going to start on on the uh, fourth fret. I'm going to go four, six, seven. Okay. You do that 
eight times one, two, three, four. Now you go one, two, three, one, two, three, four, three, four. Then you go one, three, two, three, four, three, four. Now you go one, two, three, four, two, three, four, 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 three, four,
I really like that that stretching idea though that you were just talked about. That's really really cool technique. There's you know things to do you know that uh, can can help uh, prepare for that and to you know kind of uh, expand your stretch, which is great. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, someone in the chat had a question here. Um, I think it was Rocant fifty six. He was saying, um, I kind of lost where it was. He was at, oh yeah. He says, what is Steve's live and studio setup? And I know we had an earlier question from Carlos Santon too. Last time you were on the show, you were talking about a boss product you were using for your, um, your sound processing, but can you tell us kind of what you're using now amp wise, effects wise and things like that? Yeah, sure. I'm using the ISP theta, theta X. Okay. Right? In fact, that's what I'm playing through right now. And, um, I'm just going through a couple of little micro speakers here. Uh, it sounds much better through a, a real amplifier and, and, uh, you know, a couple of Marshall caps, but, um, you know, I'm just doing it in here. So I'm just kind of keeping it light. Um, but, you know, I like to check out different gear all the time. Back in the day, like if you look at, back at the solo for Hammerhead, mm-hmm. say for, you know, you'll see a rack next to me, a 20 space rack, and every every space on that rack is filled up with something, you know, <laughs> like, like Rush, like the ADA system and, and the Rocktron and all that. You know, I was always experimenting with different stuff, including the Marshall, um, you know, preamp that they had out for a while. And so I was always trying different things. And they were throwing them at me like frisbees, you know. I mean, yeah. it was just like, like, hey, try this, you know. And so, and I was like, I'd go to a NAMM show. One NAMM show I went to, and I walked out with 12 guitars. Oh, my goodness. And they were all nice guitars. And I'm going, what am I going to do with all these, you know. Yeah. But uh, it was really cool. They just wanted me to check them out, see if I liked them, you know. And, and same thing with the gear. I'd be walking out with, with different rack mount stuff and different pedals and everything. And they Basically, they're just kind of throwing them at you and like, here, check this out. Let me know what you think. And they'd give you their card and everything. Hopefully that uh, you would endorse it, in, in well, other words. Yep. Yeah. Money for nothing and gifts for free. There you go. That's right. Where You want to talk about some small gear, something we're going to be talking about on Sunday. I was kind of telling you about this off the air, but one of your college alums, uh, Jennifer Batten's on my other show on uh, Helix Sour on Sunday. And one of the cool things about her um, I mean, I know you guys go way back, but she's of the mindset that if the stuff doesn't fit in my suitcase, I'm not using it. I don't care how good it is. It has to fit in my suitcase. And one of the things we're taking a look at, she just got... Who, Jennifer said that? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. exactly what I do. There if you it go. doesn't fit, on my, fit in my carry-on, I don't take it. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Everything else, you know, it's always supplied. I, I have a back, mm-hmm. backline rider that I have to have there. But no, if it doesn't fit in my suitcase, I don't take it. That's right. And then I have a double gig guitar bag that I just carry on my back, and that's got my wireless unit in it and everything, and and that's it. I just have a guitar case and a suitcase. So fantastic. Well, and that's... I travel light, and then that way I don't have to check anything. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes I have to gate check my guitar, my guitars, I should say, because they're both in one case. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, the suitcase comes with me with with my uh, effects board right inside of it. That's perfect. We're going to be taking a look at a, like a competing product on Sunday, but we're going to be taking a look at this guy here. It's pretty small. Oh, it's, that's great. What is that? That's the brand new from Line 6. It's called the HX Stomp. So you're probably familiar with Helix. Helix is up yeah. there. Like, the, you know, you got your Kempers, you got your Helix, you got your Fractals, you got your uh, right. gig boards or the head rushes, I should say. So this is basically Helix in a, in a size of a, basically like a double size MXR pedal. That's all it is. All the Helix. Okay, now, has it got, okay, now those three switches on the front, mm-hmm. uh, are those three different sounds? Can you program it that way? Or... Yep. yep. Okay. So you can use it. As... So then you have three presets you can go to right away before you have to go to another bank. Yeah. Or get this. Here's what's really cool. With any digital model, any digital model out there, all of them, the ISP, Boss, um, everybody, even Line Six. If you're going to go from preset to preset, everybody has a bit of a, um, um, like a millisecond of, of dropout. Everyone has. No right. one, no one has it, so it's not perfect like that. So you can set it up to be a stomp. I could have like a phaser. I can have a chorus. I can have a distortion if I want to set it that way. Or I can have presets. And inside, what Line 6 does is they have a thing called snapshots. So uh-huh. picture you got your Marshall amp behind you. And for your rhythm tone, you know, it's a one channel amp, we'll say. For your rhythm tone, you've got hardly any gain and your volume's about halfway. And then for your lead tone, if you would have a second Marshall, your lead tone would be gain probably three o'clock and your master volume up higher. So it's almost like you're taking a snapshot and a, uh, with a camera of how you would set that up. And these products, you create a snapshot. So it's the same preset inside a preset with things changed. Maybe there's phaser on that part of the uh, snapshot that wasn't on the other one. There's no latency. So you switch. There's nothing. It's phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Now, the only limitation uh-huh. in something like this compared to the bigger brother is you can only have six blocks. But for you, I can see you no problem. Rhythm, I mean, sorry, like a reverb delay, 
um, maybe maybe some kind of a modulation effect, an amp mm-hmm. modeler, um, and you still got a couple blocks left over. Right. Oh man, that sounds perfect. So, that thing's a lot smaller it, <clears throat> than what I'm using right now. Look at the size of my hand compared to it. I mean, you know, it's six, wow, that's amazing. Six hundred bucks U.S. And I'm certainly not trying to sell them on there. I'm just trying to pitch it. Out. Say that again. It, it just came out just about a month ago. Yeah. Yeah. A month ago. Okay, I haven't even seen that one yet. Yeah. Because take... I'm always shopping around, mm-hmm. looking at um, you know different online buying sites just to see what new gear is out there. Yeah. You know, like Sweetwater and stuff. Yeah, of course. See. Yeah, they're one of the best for sure. Well, yeah. We're, this is kind of funny because I've had Jennifer on the show here before, and you know we we're talking about you know over her time in Michael Jackson and obviously the Eddie Van Halen you know influence and connection things like that. So this is a real twist. She's coming on a completely different show on Sunday, and I'll make sure I say hi to her uh, for you. But. Um, you yeah, know, she's moved over to this and she's like, hey, do you think you can help me build a she, she was for the rest of my life? I'm going to be being asked to play the beat it guitar solo. Can you help me with that? So I made a preset for her and I've sent it to her and I'm really nervous because I haven't heard back from her yet. We talk a lot, but I'm kind, uh-huh. of, I'm kind of feeling that she's like, how am I going to tell Eric his preset sucks? You know, I, I, oh, right. I, I don't right. know if that's the case and I'm hoping that's not the case, but we'll find out on Sunday. But it's really cool. You dive into this thing. No learning curve. And you can have everything from a Dumble to a Fender to a Marshall to a Diesel to, you know, whatever you want. So just as as those three buttons, though, you can have those each set as a preset. Like, say, for one, number one would be like a, a heavy-duty lead with some delay on it. Number two would be just like a, a stock rhythm that you really like. And number three would be a clean sound with some some chorusing on it, stuff like that. Yep. And so that that would be really convenient to have that on stage and then maybe be able to go to another bank and have them switch into three different effects yes you can so do that if it can do that then that's all i really need you should look into yeah. it um hit up your local music store down your way wherever that is if they have a look, look for line six so just go in and check yeah. one out ash down here in guitar center and all that but the sam ash down here is huge it's perfect they'll have them that well yeah. I, I shouldn't say they're, they're selling so much right now that some stores won't have them. give them a call before you go down there unless you're going down yeah. you know to look at some other stuff as well too but um, yeah, it's kind of it's one to pass it along to you and, and share share some of the uh, you know other cool things that are out there. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, what I can do is is also what I like about Sweetwater is everything that they have come out. They demo it so you can hear the sounds in it and everything. Mm-hmm. So you can always watch the video of exactly what the the new pedal sounds like or whatever it may be. That's right. There's if you get a chance sometime. Uh, obviously, not I, you're really busy with the tour and things like that too. But take a look on my channel here. Um, I got them in playlists. So if you go to the homepage of my channel, I've got playlists for EVH and gear, which you're on now. Then I've got uh-huh. the Helix Hour, and there's one with a big yellow thumbnail. And my Canadian buddy here, he's pretty much one of the most recognized guys in the Line Six community for for uh, he has this dialing in series. You know, he could do a dialing in Steve Lynch series, and, and he would show how to get your tone. He would do a dialing in Jimi Hendrix and show how to get his tone. Um, but he's a master of this uh, stomp, and he was actually commissioned by Line 6 to provide presets for it. So it comes with about t- 10 of his presets. So right. he was here in my studio, literally physically here in the studio. We only live about an hour apart. He came down here a couple weeks ago, and um, he's demoing the product himself on my channel. Take a look at that. That'll give you a good idea of what it can do. Oh, very cool. Yeah, and it's it's well, only an hour long, and you can skip through it. Too. You'll just see, you know, it's, it's just watch where I'm not nodding my head a million times like this and just watch for him playing, and you'll get to, right. uh, to, get to hear it physically. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Let's go back to the chat for the last few minutes here. We just got about five minutes left in the program. I want to make sure I didn't um, uh, miss anybody. I know I missed a few. Uh, so Mark Dillon was asking you about your guitar, but we I know you discussed it earlier, but just drop the name one more time, the one that you're currently using. I know you're working on something else, but the current one, again, is a... It's it's called a Dale Roberts. Here it is. Dale Roberts, nice. <laughs> Roberts guitars. There you go. Uh, but there, it's just a small shop out of um, Jacksonville, Florida, and he just does great work. And um, I just I had this design in mind, and I I brought up my design. We kept on working on it until it was skinny as I wanted it to be and light as I wanted it to be, and and uh, this is the way it worked out. And I put my old graph on it from the. Uh, from the um, 80s, that's actually, a lot of people have asked me about what that is, and the graph is actually, um, you know, on a graph, so I put one graph on the guitar, so basically that's what it is. It's not a a heartbeat, it's not a lightning bolt, it's just a graph. I I, uh, I tried to duplicate that on the thumbnail for your video here today, and I failed at it miserably. And I'm a graphic designer, but I I, I always thought it might have been a pulse or like a, a radio wave or something, so it's nice to know. Yeah, that's what it was. But it can be any of those things. <laughs> of course, it could. That's right. I love that. You know, okay. if, if you got a pulse, you're you're a candidate to listen to the monograph. That's for sure. Yeah, no, that's right. Exactly. That's right. 
Uh, Rob uh, Gagario says, great interview, Eric. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and Scott Connor says uh, he noticed when he met Joe Satriani that his hands aren't that big. So it goes to show you, you don't have necessarily have to have uh, huge hands to be able to do um, the tricks, you know, is, is how you use them, right? That can be taken in right. many different ways too, but um guess who else eric you have some serious good interview skills awesome thank you i'm, I'm learning every day i appreciate that though very much appreciate it um okay this is a very good question so um chad woodruff says uh you talked about warm-up routines do you have a specific warm-up routine to get ready like basically maybe physically for yourself and for your hands yes um okay like that one i was talking about earlier with the two hands like when you're going well what i would do is that's one, two, three, four, but then you go through all the number combinations. One, two, three, four, 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 three,
Now, watch when I pick them both and bend it up slowly. What you do is you have one pitch going up and one pitch going down, and they start crossing each other, and it's a really ugly pitch that you get. So you can hear one going up and one going down. See what I mean? It's just, it's just like a really sick sound. That is cool. Uh, yeah, but that's just one of those things where you just you just experiment. And I, I actually accidentally hit that one time when I was just goofing around, and I thought, wait a minute, that was kind of cool. How did I it's do just, that? Uh, that thing where, You can get these different pitches. I watched Steve Vai do that one time where he was actually getting pitches by bending his string off the neck over the front. See what I mean? Like that. Da, 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 da. And um, I thought that's that's kind of a cool effect, but he worked on it to the point where he actually, you know, got the notes, you know, to come out really clearly with it. I agree. The last, the second last one you did, uh, I, I, you know, just to give an analogy, I like to try to put a, a picture in everybody's minds. I, I uh, when you're doing the the really deep bends there, I could picture two whales having a very good time out in the ocean somewhere to that little sound. <laughs> it's not like a mating right. call of whale. Yes, that's perfect. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. Listen, we are at the 1030 mark. I have had a, a fantastic evening with you. I told you it would go by fast. Um, 90 minutes yeah, feels like 45. Fast, absolutely. I'm going to do the same thing again like I did last time. I'm going to extend an open invitation maybe in the spring of uh, 2019. Are you doing NAM sure. this this year? Uh, yes, we'll be at NAM, so I'll see you there. Oh, good. You'll meet my boy, too. He's coming with me, so it's going to be a lot of fun. He'll be uh, thrilled to uh, to meet you. And actually, thank you once again, too. You were kind enough to send not only myself... But uh, Eric Jr., some nice 8x10s autographed and uh, guitar picks. He treasures them greatly. And I've got you on my rock wall, very proudly displayed. So uh, oh, very cool. you're, you're a class act, and we really appreciate you here. And I know the people here in the chat, uh, both guys and girls, really enjoy you. And, you know, we grew up listening to you. And, and you're, you're a good role model for, for people out there uh, getting into guitar. Maybe just before we go, can you just a little bit of advice for someone, you know, that wants to be the next guitar hero out there? What could you say to him or her? Yeah, find your own niche. And always play, get to know your theory. This is really important is getting to know your theory. And always play with emotion. I mean, you know, really, it takes sometimes life's bitter situations to make you be able to play that way. But listen to blues players the way that they bend and the way that they play bravado and stuff, because a lot of that's lost in today's guitar playing. Um, not that you want to become a blues player, uh, but you just want to be able to pick up that technique from them and find something, experiment on the guitar, and, and with different amplifiers and effects and everything that becomes yours. Just like, okay, say, for instance, the Edge of U2. Mm -hmm. You know, Edge just plays all these incredible sounds. You know, he's not a real technical player or anything, but he, he just, that's his thing. And you know, he's, if that's him playing it right as soon as you first hear him. So it's more about what your ingenuity is, how you innovate, you know, how you create, you know, and how original you sound. That's what it's all about. And write, write, write. Get into writing songs. It's, there's there's a million guys that can play out there that are playing a million miles an hour and sweeping these arpeggios all over the house. Okay, but the thing is, are they playing? You know, are they making money off of it? Mm -hmm. The way to make money is from the writing, period. Very well said. And I really like how you've mentioned um, uh, The Edge. I'll throw another guitar player out there that I love a lot, and I don't necessarily think he's got the, you know, the, the vocabulary of some other of these shredders. Tom Morello... You know the way yes. he the way he uses effects. So here's here's a piece of advice I'm going to use for what you've said and expand here as well too, is don't be hindered by your technical ability. Your ability that you don't have today may not be what's holding you back. You know it could be that right. trick. It could be that little thing. Maybe you're using a TV remote control or a ray gun like Steve, you know Steve Stevens or whatever. You know yeah. whatever it is, find your thing like you said and um, go with it, man. You don't have to be the world's. And, and even Eddie has said shredding is cool, not all the time. Right, exactly, exactly. Find your own niche, perfect it, and that's who you are. That's it. Thank you. Great advice. We've had some great comments in the in the chat towards the end here. Everyone's enjoying the show. They're very appreciative of your uh, your time with us this evening, and uh, we wish you the continued success with the tour. I guess last thing, um, <laughs> there's always a last thing. The album obviously did so very very well. Um, is there an itch to get back in the studio and do another one? Yes, eventually, but right now. You know, we've got this album out, and we've only released a couple singles off of it. There's also some more, you know, and, and probably towards the end of next year, we'll probably get back in and start recording some new material. Good to and hear. It'll, it'll take a different turn, too, of course. we always, I always like to do something a little bit different on each album, you know, like why approach it the same way? You know, do something a little bit different. Good, good, fantastic. 
We picked up some new people here tonight as well. We're very thankful. So listen, uh, we hope everyone enjoyed the show, and I hope you're able to warm up your weekend. Come and see us again over on Sunday, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 12 p.m. Pacific. Steve's good friend, Jennifer Batten, uh, GIT uh, alum, is going to be on the show. We're going to have some fun with her as well. And uh, Steve, I'll say goodbye to you off here, but thank you again for a killer show. You, uh, you, you hit a home run for us tonight. Oh, great. Thank you very much, Eric. I appreciate it. No problem. Don't go away. We'll say goodbye off here. Everyone, thanks so much. Have a great weekend. Stay uh, safe out there, and we'll see you very soon. Until next time. Cheers. Okay, sounds good. Thank you again. Hey, you're still here? Eric Jr. here, reminding you to check out our full lineup of quality merch. Available right now in the Broadstash Boutique. Quality products and fast shipping. Visit Broadstash.com today. I am now on Patreon. If you enjoy my content and wish to support my channel and what I do, then please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash evhgeartv. Your support assures the continued growth of this channel and a fun community in which to share our love for Van Halen, music gear, and much more. My name is Eric Redman, Wolfgang Guitar. Video production services provided by Design39 Media. Visit design39media.com for all your website, photography, and video production needs. Microphones for EVH and Gear TV are provided by Rode Microphones. And official Van Halen merchandise is provided by vanhalenstore.com.